Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks um, to everyone who has come to this talk. Uh, so my name is Deirdre McIntyre, and um, it's my great honor uh, today to host Dr. Kate Granger at Google. Um, I actually came across Kate's um, Twitter account a couple of years ago, and uh, it really struck a chord with me. And so I've kind of kept in contact and tracked her <laughs> over the last couple of years. Um, for anyone who doesn't know Kate, uh, Kate is an accomplished doctor, writer, um, and she also has an MBE, um, which is pretty cool. So on top of doing all those things, um, in her spare time, she started a, a global campaign to basically um, make sure that, you know, being in a patient in a hospital is a bit more of a, a kind of a human thing. Um, so today she's going to talk to us about that campaign um, and she's going to talk to us about her learnings from uh, kicking it off. So uh, please welcome Dr. Kate Granger. So thank you for that really kind introduction, Deirdre. Um, hello, my name's Kate. Um, the reason I'm using that phrase will become apparent as we go through my story. And I'm going to tell you a story today. It's probably going to be quite different from anything you might have heard before at a Google talk. So here goes. So I'm just one girl who had one simple idea which brought about a global change. Um, and you might think, well, how's that girl from the UK managed that? Um, and I guess I need to tell you my story to, to get there. So, I don't know if anyone can spot me in this picture. Um, this is my graduation day from Edinburgh University, and I'm just there. Um, that's ten and a half years ago when I graduated as a doctor. Very proud day for me, started my career working in the NHS, um, working throughout specialties in medicine and eventually working my way, way up to be, becoming a consultant in medicine for older people, which is kind of my lifelong professional ambition. And a week after that day graduating, um, I got married to my lovely husband Chris, who's with me today. Um, and we had a very special wedding day and it, it was just how we wanted it. Um, and, and we started our personal lives together as, as husband and wife, um, moved into a flat, started working and everything seemed absolutely perfect with our lives. So if we fast forward a few years, it's July 2011 and Chris and I have decided that we need a holiday. We've been working really hard Everything's been manic at, at work. I've been doing all my exams and, and Chris has been working his way up the management ladder at Asda, which is the UK version of Walmart. Um, and we thought we'd take a holiday. Very lucky that Chris's auntie and uncle live in Santa Cruz, um, just down the coast. So this is us on a beach in Santa Cruz, um, looking like we don't have a care in the world. Um, we've got, both got good jobs, no money worries. We're thinking about having a family and, and life is just idyllic. Um, but for the fact that I just don't feel very well, and I haven't felt very well for maybe a couple of weeks in the run up to the trip, but I'm being your typical doctor and just ignoring it. Um, and I got off the plane and I started with this kind of niggling pain in my side and it just wouldn't go away and nothing was really working to make it better. I was just popping paracetamol, hoping, hoping that for the best and procrastinating about it. But unfortunately, my symptoms got worse and worse and worse until Chris took charge of the situation as a non-doctor in our relationship and decided actually it was time to seek some medical attention. So we ended up in the emergency room at the Dominican Hospital in Santa Cruz, um, where after relatively little tests, they'd found out that I was really very sick. My kidneys had failed um, and they did some scans to find out the reason for that. And unfortunately, those scans showed that I was riddled with cancer. I had tumours throughout my pelvis and my abdomen. I had lymph nodes everywhere. They were blocking the tubes between my um, kidneys and my bladder, which is why my kidneys had failed. Um, and I was really desperately ill. So I got patched up in the States. They popped some stents into my ureters to get my kidneys working again. And thankfully, that worked. Um, and we took the decision that we wanted to come home. Um, they kind of wanted to transfer us to Stanford and do operations and things, but I knew if we did that, we'd be in the States forever. So I, I just wanted to go home. So as soon as I was well enough, we hopped 
back on a flight to the UK and started my journey as a patient in the NHS. Um, I was admitted quite soon after we got home and with my presumed ovarian cancer um, and, and we sort of started what was a disastrous journey actually, it was really catastrophic. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. So my kidneys failed again. I ended up with nephrostomies, which are tubes that stick out of your back and drain your urine into bags. Um, I had to have that done on both sides. So I had two bags to carry around all the time with me. You can imagine getting in and out of bed, it was horrendous. Um, I developed a really severe infection on my left kidney, which took ages to get better. And during these first few weeks of being a patient, um, they were trying to work out what, what was wrong with me. Because for the, they knew from the time they put the biopsy under the microscope that I didn't have ovarian cancer. Um, they knew it was something much rarer, but they weren't sure what. So they came back to me with a, a group of tumours that it belonged to as the small round blue cell tumours. And I was like, you're joking, right? They can't be called the small round blue cell tumours. That is so unimaginative. I wanted like a proper na juicy name for a tumour, but no. Um, and, and you can see lots of small round blue cells, I grant them that. Um, but it took a lot of immunohistochemistry and fancy cytogenetics to actually come back with a diagnosis. And that was given to me four weeks into my journey as a desmoplastic small round cell tumour, which is an incredibly rare type of sarcoma. It affects just one in two million people, usually teenage boys. So why it was picking on a middle-aged woman, I don't know. Um, and that was me. It spread to my liver and my bones. So I was in a palliative, non-curative situation from the outset. We had a lot of big decisions to make at that point about what we did. This tumour does respond to chemotherapy in some cases, and in some cases it has no, absolutely no response to chemotherapy. And um, So if I'd gone for treatment and it hadn't worked, then I could have ruined the last few months of my life with medical intervention. And if I did go for it, then I could have, you know, got a really good outcome and, and lived for a long time. We, we went for chemotherapy. It was a really hard, long journey. Initially, had, I had five cycles. It was very tough. I was in and out of hospital. My bone marrow kept failing. I kept getting really serious infections. I kept bleeding. I needed multiple transfusions. Life was really very tough. Um, but on New Year's Eve 2011, I'd been through my fifth cycle and I was just back in hospital after it. And I just kind of came to the decision that the burden of what I was going through was outweighing any benefits it was giving me. So we kind of took the decision together that we were going to stop chemotherapy at that point. Um, because I wanted to do one thing. And this might sound a bit crazy for somebody who's got a terminal cancer diagnosis, but I wanted to go back to work. Um, I'd been told I wasn't going to work again, um, and I was absolutely desperate to prove my oncologist wrong. So three weeks later, after I made that decision, I was back on the wards, looking after patients who had stroke, um, and, and really loving, loving my career. So then I was well for 18 months, which is really unheard of in this tumour. People normally get, you know, three, six months, that kind of time scale. So 18 months was really prolonged. Um, well time and we did loads of things during that time we took lots of items off the bucket list and really enjoyed life and um, until sort of september october time 2013 when things started to progress again quite quickly i noticed a lump in my neck and i was getting a lot more pain um, and then obviously bigger decisions about chemotherapy no chemotherapy knowing how tough it was going to be but knowing that it could give me you know a lot more quality time um, so we went for chemotherapy again. I had four further cycles. I had a good response. I got 12 months more good time. Um, and since then, I've had two further um, courses of just two cycles each time, just to try and keep me well for as long as possible. I'm just recovering from that fourth course of chemotherapy now. Um, and it's taken me a few weeks to get back on my feet, but obviously I'm well enough to come to America. So. Things are all good at the moment. So that's my story. 
Um, during that time, I've been through a huge amount of healthcare. Um, I've had multiple operations on my kidneys, I've had radiology interventions, I've um, had so many scans I can't count them, I've been to loads of primary care appointments, I've been to loads of oncology appointments, I've been in lots of different hospital wards. Um, and during that time, it's given me a lot of time to reflect about what being a good doctor is, what makes a good nurse, what, what is care, why does compassion matter in, in healthcare? Um, and I've sat inside rooms by myself reflecting on these things an awful lot. And during that time, I've, I've written about them as well. And I started by writing a couple of books, and then I started blogging and tweeting and, and sharing my experience of healthcare. Primarily as something to do with my time that's productive, but also that I'm a really avid medical teacher. It's part of my role that I do an awful lot of medical teaching. And me sharing my experience is kind of me teaching in, in a funny sort of way. And during that time, I sort of distilled my thoughts about care into four values. Now, I don't know if you have organisational values at Google. We, we have them in our, our organisation. Chris has them up. Uh, Asda. Um, but I think it's important to have your own personal values, things that matter to you as, as a professional, but for me also as a patient. Um, and the things that matter to me are that people communicate with me properly. When, when communication is good, I tend to have a good patient experience, and when it's not so good, that's when things tend to break down. That the little things are really celebrated and um, just people take care of them. And when I say the little things, I mean, you know, when somebody comes into a hospital room and they stand over you, it's really horrible and intimidating, and somebody could just sit down, and so you're on the same level. That makes a huge difference to me when I'm a patient and feeling vulnerable. Um, or somebody holding your hand when you're upset and breaking, you know, all these horrible news stories to me. It's, it's really nice if somebody offers that tactile reassurance. Even somebody getting you a drink or just those tiny acts of kindness, they really matter to me. And the third thing that matters is that I'm at the centre of my care. Um, all too often as a patient, you can find yourself just somewhere out on the periphery and people are working really hard to try and make you better. But those decisions are just whirring around and you're not part of them. Um, if anybody knew anything about me, it's that I'm a slight control freak um, and that I really want to be involved in my decisions and it's really important to me that I'm at the core of what's happening. Um, so person-centred care is something that I really aspire to when I, I'm working and try to find out what my patients want. And that kind of leads me on to my fourth value, um, which is about seeing me as a person. Um, I don't want to be seen as that girl with a rare cancer or bed seven. I want to be seen as Kate. Kate, who's the doctor, who's a wife to Chris, who is an avid baker, who plays a flute, who's got three nephews and a gorgeous niece. You know, all these things about my life are so much more important than the fact I've got cancer. Um, and I think finding out about those things before you become a patient so finding out about the person who's got the illness is much more important than, than focusing right in on, on the condition that people have. So these are my stents, um, the tubes that drain my kidneys, and they're very important to me. Um, they mean that I don't have to live my life with those tubes sticking out of my back, which is horrendous. Um, and I can get on planes and go to America and I can do all good things like jumping out of aeroplanes and, and such like. But they do need to be replaced every so often and that's a small operation. Um, and I had that operation done in August 2013. Everything went very smoothly and I was home the same day. Unfortunately, 36 hours later at home, I started shivering and I had a fever um, and I was dragged back to hospital kicking and screaming by my husband. You can kind of see the, the, the story going. Um, I'm always the irrational one when I'm, um, when I'm unwell. Anyway, dragged, dragged back to the emergency room by my, my husband um, where we met a number of people. We met a doctor who was one of the doctors 
And it was really hard to extract his name um, and his role, which is important to me. I need to know who I'm talking to. Um, and then a healthcare assistant, I'm a clinical support worker, I'm not sure which, because she didn't introduce herself, came to do my bloods and, and put a cannula in for me. And then a nurse came to put my antibiotics up and she didn't interact with me at all. In fact, she was talking to another, pa another nurse about another patient the whole time she was putting my antibiotics up. So I just felt like, you know, one of those mannequin arms that people practice doing blood tests on? You know, that's, that's what I felt like. Um, and then I met Brian, and Brian restored my face somewhat. He was a porter. He, he was really nice. He had a name. He recognised that I was in pain. In fact, he was the first person to recognise I was in pain. Out of all these healthcare professionals, he got me an extra pillow and a blanket to make sure that I was comfortable. Um, and then he took extra care pushing the trolley over the bumps in the corridor so that he didn't exacerbate my pain. And the whole time, Brian was talking to me and Chris. Just about everyday stuff. But it really mattered to me because I hate being pushed around a hospital that I know very well, knowing that at every turn I could bump into somebody who'll either blank me because they don't recognise me when I'm in patient role or they'll have a really awkward conversation with me, neither of which are pleasant. Um, and Brian just took away all that anxiety and, and phobia about hospital just by being nice and attending to those little things that I was talking about before. And I was in hospital for just under two weeks um, and I met lots of people during that time. And I would say the vast majority didn't introduce themselves. It was an expectation that you'd just put your arm out to have your blood pressure taken and people would just do that task and not kind of focus on you being a person um, with an arm who's got a blood pressure. Um, or people would give me antibiotics or put tablets in front of me and have very little interaction. Now, it sounds very strange but because you're surrounded by people all day, but being in hospital is actually really very lonely because you have your loved ones restricted by visiting times. So you, you're there and th you're having these very brief interactions with people that often feel meaningless. Um, and it, it can be really, really very lonely. So one evening I was sort of talking to Chris about everything um, that was going on and I, I was kind of reflecting on the fact that I thought introductions should be present. I thought they were really important and um, they're the first thing we're taught at medical school. When you approach a patient you say who you are, what you're going to do, you ask them what they want to be called and, and you start the interaction that way so that you, don't, you get off on the right footing and I just felt like something had gone wrong. In the whole process of care something had gone wrong. And so I, I call it passionately reflecting, but Chris calls it ranting. <laughs> um, and that evening he kind of inspired me because he told me to stop whinging and do something. Um, so, so we did. So we, the, the initial idea was to use my already significant presence on social media to get a conversation going about introductions in healthcare um, and why they're important um, and get, get people just reflecting on it. Um, and when people reflect, sometimes they change their behaviour. So um, if you're going to do anything on social media, you need a catchy hashtag, don't you? So um, Chris came up with, hello, my name is, and off we went on a, a, a strange journey that's taken us all over the country and all over the world. Um, and it's, yeah, it's been, it's been rather exciting. This is the first tweet I ever sent about the, the campaign. So if I step aside a little bit and consider social media, when you, when you think about social media, I think about the banality of it. So you've got Justin Bieber, haven't you? He doesn't say anything very useful a lot of the time, and yet he's got how many followers? 69.1 million followers. Um, so, so he's like one of the most followed people. The president's just got involved, hasn't he? He's, he's just started his Twitter account. Um, he's only sent 159 tweets and has already amassed himself 5 million followers, but not quite as many as Justin Bieber. But people have used social media for charity things and for positive things as well as the banality of it um, and 
I'm sure you had the ice bucket challenge in the US. We, it was certainly a big thing in the UK, raising money for motor neuron disease, or I think you guys call it ALS. Um, so that was a big thing and raised millions of pounds for charity. We had the no makeup selfie in the UK, which raised money for Cancer Research UK. So um, a lot of people took to Twitter, including our celebrities without their makeup and, and donated money that way. But can you actually use social media to change behaviour? Because um, I guess that's what hashtag hello my name is, is about. We're trying to induce a change. So I was trying to think of things that um, had, had used social media in a positive way to, to change behaviour. And this is a, a campaign that was run in the UK by Public Health England to try and get women exercising more. So it's, it's called This Girl Can. Um, and the hashtag went quite viral over over in England and um, there was a, an ad campaign that went with it and, and lots of social media activity. So that kind of brings me back to hashtag hello my name is and what we did with it. So I decided that we needed to give it a visual identity because um, we had got a conversation going, there were lots of people tweeting about it my experience was not unique, which gave me even more motivation to get, get something going because there was lots of patients saying to me, yes, this has happened to me, yes, this really matters to me. There were all sorts of stories, like women having babies, getting vaginal examinations by people they didn't know during labour and things, you know, really horrible things happening to people out there across the world. And I was like, yeah, this really needs to change. We, we need a mind change to make us think of uh, patients as people first and foremost and you have to think of the person in front of you as a as a person if you share names you make that connection it's it's really it's part of how we're brought up socially it's common courtesy so we gave it a visual identity with a logo um, which included a smile because it's not just about saying those words, it's about how you say them. Um, and a smile is an instant anxiety reliever as a patient. If, if a healthcare professional smiles at you, it, you instantly feel better um, about whatever's going to happen to you. So that's why the smile is there. I blogged about the campaign and invited people to kind of pledge their support. My clever IT geek brother designed us a website so we, we could collate resources and um, things that were happening with the, with the campaign. I got it on Facebook because obviously not everyone uses Twitter, so I thought I'd try and get it on another social media channel, so Facebook page was born. And if you go to YouTube, you'll find lots and lots of videos about hashtag hello my name is videos that have been done by trusts, videos by students, um, videos um, across the world actually, you know, there's things from Australia, New Zealand, um, the US. And I'm just going to show you a little video now of um, my, my own trust where I work doing their little pledges. <laughs> video always makes me smile because there's some of the people that I work with who are really important to me professionally. Um, but when people smile at you, it does make you want to smile back, doesn't it? Um, so if you have a simple idea that takes hardly any time, costs no money and improves patient experience, then politicians want to get involved, don't they? So these are some of our politicians in the, in the UK supporting the campaign. And so we've got our Prime Minister and we're at number 10 Downing Street there. Um, this is our Health Secretary um, supporting the campaign and then that's the First Minister of Scotland. 
But we've also got some slightly more famous people. Politicians might not be that famous, but Chris and I have met all sorts of people on, on our journey um, while we've been ticking the bucket list. And Chris meets lots of people at his work um, and he's always there ready with his hello, my name is sign. Now you might think this is a bit geeky or a bit gimmicky, um, but I think it's really, it's a, it's a really good way of raising the profile of something. And if you get people talking about something on social media, then you spread a message. And so I'm quite proud of our little celebrity hall, which includes Kylie Minogue and Drew Barrymore, um, to include others. But we've kind of taken this out of social media now, which is the wonderful thing. It's spread right across our health service. Um, we've got 112 NHS trusts on board supporting it, promoting it with their staff and trying to get that behaviour change that we all want. Um, and one of the things we've done to kind of help push that along a bit and keep the momentum of the campaign going is um, going on tour, which sounds kind of rock chickish, doesn't it? We, we went on tour in June um, and we visited 16 healthcare organisations. We went 2,000 miles and met 2,000 people. Um, and the reception at every place was really, really inspiring. And this is as a, um, a clinical commission, commissioning group near Burnley in, in Lancashire, in the north of England. So um, there were lots of people wanting to come and hear my story and, and using it in their teaching um, and, and in their own healthcare practice, which was amazing. But the beauty of when you send a tweet is that you don't just reach your own country, you reach the world. Um, so hashtag hello my name is has caught on in other places. We have Italian versions of it, Spanish versions, French versions, German versions. Um, it spread right across Australia. Um, in fact, one of the people that I used to work with um, who now works in Sheffield has just gone to Australia to do some talks and he tweeted me to say, Kate, it's everywhere. <laughs> I can't believe you're so global. Um, and it's, it's spread right across New Zealand. We're, we're working on the US. We're getting there. It's been slightly slower to get going, but I think, I think we're starting to get there. Um, but also in places you might not expect. So the um, volunteers who looked after patients who were suffering with Ebola in Sierra Leone had decided that they wanted to support the campaign in some way. And one of the things they thought about is putting a picture of themselves on their protective equipment and then writing their names on the helmet because they've got so many barriers between them and their patients that they really thought, thought about it. And I thought that was a, an amazing way of, of expressing the campaign. So I thought I'd Google hashtag hello my name is and see how many results I got. <laughs> so 109,000 results on hash and the first, I think, 20 pages are all things to do with my campaign. Um, it's very difficult to sort of measure these things though, isn't it? I can't go into every healthcare organisation and see if these things are happening every time. Although some junior doctors are using it as a driver for quality improvement projects and are doing exactly that, uh, recording how many times people introduce themselves, promoting the campaign and then going back and trying to see a change. Um, people have seen changes in their patient experience surveys after they've introduced a campaign. And I think a lot of it's around how it changes a culture and what I was saying about seeing your patients as people. So it's not just necessarily introducing yourself. It's that mind shift to change how you actually think about people. Um, but we can measure on social media how much people are talking about a topic. So recently we reached our one billion Twitter impression mark, which I'm very proud of. Um, and it, it equates to six tweets an hour. So if anyone tweets in the audience, but tweet and tweet away and um, push those numbers up a little bit. So as, as Deirdre mentioned in her introduction, I went to the palace in June to receive my um, MBE. And that was obviously a very special day. But the reason I went there to get an MBE was because my services to the NHS and to improving care globally had been recognised. Um, and that was just completely overwhelming and an incredibly special day for Chris and, Chris and my parents and me. <laughs> 
So I guess I'm going to come back to what I started with. So one person can have one simple idea um, and make a global change. So I thought I'd leave you with a question. And what could you change? I'm just a normal girl from Yorkshire who brought about a change in healthcare, but everyone's got that potential within them. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you for listening. Thank you, first of all. Um, I think I saw a study recently that correlated um, a person's actual health with the empathy of their caregiver. Mm -hmm. Yep. Am I getting this right? Yeah. So did you start that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't, but that studies, um, there's, there's several studies out there that the better the relationship you have with your healthcare provider, the better your outcome. Um, and it's been repeated in, in sort of surgical settings, in cancer settings. Um, and I think that's why this is so important, that we've got to start those re relationships and consider those relationships as ther therapeutic in themselves. That whatever the, the treatments we give or the surgeries we, we do or whatever we do as healthcare professionals, we have to think of the relationship with, that we have with our patients as kind of the first um, building block of, of whatever we're going to do. Because if you think about it, you are going to comply with what your doctor recommends more if you trust them and you um, believe in what they're saying and you've worked together and collaborated on whatever the treatment plan is. Um, so I think that's probably why the outcomes are better for people who have better relationships. And you build better relationships if you're more empathic. I know that you've seen more hospitals in the UK than in the US. Did you have any impression about whether there was a big difference in the culture of the hospitals between where you were in the US and the UK with regard to introductions and being patient-centered? Um, so obviously my, my experience of being a patient in the US is fairly limited. Um, what I noticed was the, the nurses had much more time for you than they do in the UK. Um, and the doctors were kind of a bit more distant. So the, the relationship that you have with your nurse when you're an inpatient in the US seems to be really important. That seems to be the central thing that, that's, that's going on. And, and the doctors are just kind of on the periphery making doing the orders for the treatments. And then the nurses are cracking on with it. Um, <laughs> But in the UK, we're, we're a little bit more collaborative in, in the sense. But I don't know about culture. It's, it's difficult. From what people have said on Twitter and things, I think there, is, there are cultural difficulties with building relationships in the US. And there is that distance, the doctor wearing the white coat and being you know, the person who is in power, you know, in, in the powerful situation. Um, yeah, thanks so much for uh, for coming and sharing your story. Um, it was very inspirational. Um, so I think my question is uh, somewhat related to the last question, uh, which was uh, you mentioned that it, it, you know even though the campaign is uh, slowly but surely picking up steam here in the states, um, uh, I guess uh, what are some of the barriers uh, that you're coming across? That um, I mean, maybe even not barriers, but uh, you know, w what sort of factors are are uh, making it s uh, mm -hmm. sort of s slower to to uh, come to, to shape here in the U.S. and maybe how can we as Googlers and how can the viewers help uh, sort of pick up that steam here in the States? So I think one of the barriers that people often talk about is we do that already. Um, we don't need to be told something so obvious as that because we do that already. Now I think if you um, went and looked, videoed every healthcare interaction that a doctor has with a patient, they wouldn't necessarily introduce themselves all the time. They just think they do. Um, and I, I think that that sort of arrogance almost is, is really 
a, a very big barrier in this. We, we have a campaign in the UK called the Six C's, which is for nurses, um, and it's like commitment, compassion, courage, competence, you know, the things that you need to be a really good nurse. Um, and that got criticised as well for being, you know, too simplistic. We don't need to be told these things. But actually, we do. We need to go back to the basics of care and, and really sort of foster those relationships and then we can worry about all the complicated things that come after and um, so in terms of what googlers could do i think it's all about spreading a message so you're in a very powerful social media presence in in the global setting really um, and and i think anything anybody can do to spread this message is really important and um, we're all patients at times in our lives or our, pa our children are patients or uh, you know our elderly re relatives are patients um, and we, we all come into contact with healthcare during our lives and the experience of that has to be better than it is now. Great well Kate thanks again and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank Google. you.